A year after the betrayal, Dorothy Granada moved to Madagalpa. She had retreated to the capital to be alone and think about what to do next. It was 2010. She was nearly 80, but she didn't want to stop working. Then the Ministry of Health asked her to move up here to put together a training program for the midwives of the Compo. So that became what she did next. The Ministry of Health knew what she could do. She had not expected to start again in a new place at this point in her life, but that was the way it had worked out. Madagalpa was a small city in the mountains, toward the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, 80 miles from the capital. She rented a house in the hills south of the city and moved in there with a family she knew from the cooperative. The husband, a former guerrilla. The wife used to work for the police. She could have taken care of herself if she had to. But she was old now, slower and weaker than she used to be. And it was better to have help. The house was made of concrete on a dirt road with a leafy porch and enough bedrooms for her and the couple and their children. There was a cleared space in the back for a cooking fire and drying laundry, and beyond that were woods. Down in the city, it was very loud. There was always music blaring and car horns honking and motorcycles revving and people riding around in trucks shouting political slogans from megaphones. If you looked up from the streets, you could see the mountains. But in the middle of the day, they seem not to lift the city skyward, but to close it in, to trap it in a bowl of noise. Here, up in the hills, it was quiet. Behind the house, the dirt road dwindled to a path, cratered with puddles and muddied by streams over which people threw down wood planks for crossing, bordered by a mess of bushes and scrubby trees. She walked her dog there. In the living room of the house, she kept her books and old magazines, and there were a couple of comfortable chairs where she sat and read and drank her evening glass of wine. She read murder mysteries when she could get them. Most of the peace activists she knew read murder mysteries. How else to get out their aggression, she thought. They weren't allowed to kill people, so they read about it. There was a little room where she had a desk and a file cabinet and a computer. There was a photograph of her with Christopher, her son from her first marriage, their heads together. The midwives she would be training lived in remote mountain settlements far from any medical care. They had been taught by their mothers. If a woman had a difficult labor out in one of these settlements, she would die. But difficult labors rarely came as a surprise. So the key was to teach the midwives how to recognize the signs of danger and get those women to a health center. They must monitor blood pressure to watch for hypertension. They must palpate the woman's belly to feel where the baby's head was. The settlements were not even villages, but perhaps 10 or 20 huts far apart. Her trainers, obstetrical nurses, would have to walk an hour in one direction, two hours in another. Some of the houses could be reached only on foot, along dirt paths that became treacherous in the rainy season. Sometimes, at the height of that season, when the rivers were swollen, it became impossible to leave the settlements. So it was also necessary to train the midwives to cope with dangerous labor by themselves. It wasn't just a matter of the labor itself. There were other ways a pregnant woman could die. If a man beat his wife, he often grew more violent when she was pregnant. So it was not only high blood pressure and diabetes that the midwife must look for in her women, but also bruises and depression. Originally, Dorothy had planned to restrict the midwife training to women who were literate enough to keep records, but there were so few who met this standard that she had to drop it and improvise. 
If a midwife could not write, she needed to find a child who could. Dorothy raised money for basic equipment. Blood pressure gauges, bulb syringes, backpacks, rain boots, a few raincoats. The minute she started working again, she felt better. This was what she loved to do. This was what she was good at. Some people try to help one person at a time, and other people try to change the whole world. There is a seductive intimacy in the first kind of work, but it can also be messy and unpredictable. People may resent help that is so intimate, and if the help goes badly, the blunder is personal. Even when the help succeeds, the victories are small and don't really change anything. The second kind of work is more ambitious and also cleaner, more abstract but success is distant and unlikely. So it's helpful to have a taste for noble failure and for the camaraderie of the angry few. Dorothy started out in the first kind of work. She was a nurse, but in the middle of her life, she felt that nursing wasn't enough. She ought to do more. So she took up the second kind. She became an activist protesting poverty and nuclear weapons. She did that for many years. And then she realized that she didn't like the sort of person who tries to change the whole world. I was out there doing civil disobedience and all that good stuff, she says. It was all sacrifice, all for the cause. Personal happiness was not important. We were confronting the powers and principalities. We were going to jail. And then I thought, we're so serious, all us peace and justice people. These people, they can't have fun. They have to be out on the firing line all the time. For years, she had been like them. She carried the burden of duty around as they did. The world was on the brink of nuclear annihilation, and only she and these few others seemed to understand and care enough to stand up to it. These people did wonderful work, but they were not really nice people, she realized. They were people you did not want to be around. They were so sharp. Everything was a matter of life and death. We've got to do this action because the world depends on it. She thought, what makes me happy? What makes me happy is being a nurse. And why shouldn't I do what makes me happy as long as I am working for the good of the world? God didn't want you to be miserable. He wanted you to do good. In fact, she thought it was better to be happy because you did better work. She had lived so many lives already that it didn't seem like much to her to throw out this one and begin another. It would be an adventure. She was an optimist. In any way, it had been her experience that any new life was likely to be better than the one before. She was half Mexican, half Filipina, and had grown up in the ghetto in LA. The old life usually wasn't so great that she regretted leaving it. In the middle of her life, she was sick of the peace movement, and she was sick of being a brown person in North Ameri America. So in the mid-1980s, she moved to Nicaragua with her husband, Charles Gray, to work with Latinas like herself. She thought, the woman who gets up at 3 a.m. to grind the corn, she's had 13 babies, half of whom have died, either because of disease or because of the war, and this woman has never had five minutes to realize what sort of a human being she could be, because she's always cooking and having babies and burying her children, that is the woman I want to work with. She wanted to work in a clinic for women, but she didn't want to start one. She didn't want to be a gringa do-gooder coming in with a plan. She wanted to find a group of women who were already organized and looking for a nurse. It took her some time to find one. Meanwhile, she and her husband went to live 
in an assentimento, an encampment where refugees from the countryside gathered together for protection against the fighting, where she set up a clinic to train health workers. At the time, the war between the US-backed Contras and the Soviet-backed Sandinistas was at its height. The Sandinistas were in power and the Contras were trying to unseat them. She didn't know much about the Sandinistas before she got there, but she was quickly converted. She heard that on the first day after the insurrection in 1979, the Ministry of Culture was founded and the death penalty abolished, and she thought, I'm going to like this place. Health clinics were opening, even in the countryside. There were infant care centers and school lunch programs. Volunteers showed up with shovels to clear up garbage dumps together. But most of all, she was converted by the art. There were murals everywhere. It seemed that everybody was writing poetry and reading it aloud. Cultural centers were springing up, teaching people how to paint, how to dance, how to read and write. It seemed to her a kind of paradise. Can you beat a revolution like that? She says. Oh, the 80s, what a holiday. All of us poured in from all over the world. What a celebration. It was marvelous. After a few years, she heard about a women's cooperative in a town called Mulukuku that was looking for a nurse to run a clinic. The cooperative was having trouble finding someone willing to move there because it was still so dangerous. The war was officially over by then, but there were still ex-soldiers everywhere, cut loose without any money, carrying guns, kidnapping people for ransom. There were no police. Mulukuku was a new town, a frontier settlement in the middle of nowhere, 150 miles northeast of Managua, the capital. People had started turning up there during the war. There was no town then, only an army training school near the Rio Tuma and a couple of cantinas that doubled as brothels. As the fighting in the countryside grew worse, Refugees started collecting in Mulukuku in the hope that the soldiers would protect them. A few stalls with thatched roofs opened on either side of a dirt street. Horses tethered outside, pigs wandering around. Many of the people who arrived were widows from the war. So often women did the building. They cleared the land, dug latrines, put up plastic shelters and houses made out of old boards and metal sheeting. Then they established a daycare center and started a factory to make cinder blocks for proper houses. During the war, many had died from bullets shot through wood walls, so people wanted brick. Once the houses were built, the women had formed a cooperative, led by a woman named Grethel Montoya. Grethel's husband, Noel, had been an engineer in Managua, but he inherited a large tract of forest land around Mulukuku. Because farmers were fleeing the fighting, there was a shortage of food, and the government called on everyone who owned land of any kind to farm it. So Noel quit his job, cleared the land, and planted crops. By this time, there were about a thousand people living in Mulukuku. Many women were dying in labor and from unsafe abortions, and many were having more babies than they wanted. The cooperative realized the town needed a women's health clinic. Dorothy decided that this was the place. Her husband had worked as a carpenter, and he built a house for them up in the hills on the edge of town out of split bamboo held together with vines. They bathed in the creek at the foot of the hill because it was too hard to haul enough water for a bath. The mosquitoes were vicious, but they had nets at night. The women of the cooperative wanted a carpentry shop. Charles Gray taught them how to build wooden frames for houses, frames for windows, and furniture. Bit by bit, they built the clinic. In 
At first, she saw patients in a spare room in the school. And then, finally, when they had amassed enough donated money to build it, in a new cinderblock clinic, which had four consulting rooms, and a waiting space, and a dormitory for women waiting to give birth or escaping violent husbands. The clinic provided birth control. It administered prenatal tests and pap smears. Some days, there were a hundred people waiting outside the door when it opened. Because some women lived in settlements too remote for them to come to the clinic, they sent health workers out into the countryside, who traveled for many hours each way. When the roads ended, they proceeded on foot, or on horseback, or by boat. If a patient needed to be operated on, Dorothy would put her in some kind of vehicle and drive to the nearest hospital that could do what needed to be done. Matagalpa was 90 miles away, but the roads were terrible. It was 150 miles to Managua, and in the early seasons, it could take 24 hours to get there. During the rainy season, the roads flooded and became nearly impassable. Sometimes she would set out hoping that the road would hold and become trapped in mud in several feet of water and have to wait for a tractor to pull her out. Sometimes part of the road would be flooded, so they'd get out of their vehicle, carrying the patient in a stretcher, and walk until they could find another vehicle on the other side of the water. Dorothy would say to women who had had lots of babies in a few years, after this pregnancy you need to rest your body. Many women didn't want more babies. They couldn't afford it. They were exhausted. They had terrible uterine prolapses from too many pregnancies. But they were scared to use birth control because their husbands or their church opposed it. One woman's husband found her birth control pills and denounced her to their church. The members of the church shouted at her that she was a whore and they shunned her. The woman told Dorothy that she could not go through that again. She had almost died in her last labor and she knew she might die if she had another baby. But death was better than exile. There was one woman in Mulukuku very overweight with diabetes and toxemia who had given birth to six children. When she was pregnant with her seventh child, Dorothy went to her home and told her she was in danger. She should get prenatal care. She should give birth in a hospital. But the woman had given birth to babies before without any problems. She couldn't understand what the fuss was about and she refused. Dorothy pleaded with her. She went back to her home a second time to make her case, but the woman said no. Some time later, the woman went into labor and showed up at the clinic, but by that time it was too late. The baby was dead inside her. They didn't have the equipment to do a C-section, so they had to pull the baby out. It was an enormous baby. 12 pounds. It took several people to pull it out, and they had no anesthetic for the woman. It was terrible. That scene haunted Dorothy for years. What else could she have done, she wondered. Should she have kidnapped the woman? Should she have brought in the police? She saw a lot of terrible things in those days. Babies dying in front of her, women dying in childbirth, women beaten by their husbands, women killed by their husbands. She tried not to cry in front of the patients. She cried at night. The cooperative organized women in their neighborhoods so that if one woman was being beaten, the others banged their pots and pans to alert the neighborhood and scare the man off. If a husband went to jail, they tried to help the woman to support her kids they might give her a loan to start a business. Mulukuku was a new village 
Everyone who lived there had run away from somewhere else, so nobody had any roots there, and neighbors didn't know each other. A lot of the men who beat their wives were soldiers who had been demobilized when the war ended. They had come in search of land, but many had not received any pay during the fighting, only equipment and food. So even when they found land, they had no money to develop it, no money for seeds or fertilizer or fences or plows. They had no way to make a living and no purpose anymore, Dorothy thought. So they got drunk and beat their wives and felt like men again. In the early days, many women in the cooperative thought the clinic should treat only Sandinista families. But Dorothy told them that if they wanted to do that, she would leave. Though she didn't convince them at first, they needed her and backed down. To her, this wasn't so much a matter of fairness as a political tactic. She thought that healthcare could be used as a means of reconciliation. If you treated the Contras well and cured them when they were sick, they might stop hating you. And perhaps by extension, they would stop hating other Sandinistas as well. Kindness changed people. Yes, it was possible that she might sometimes cure Contras and enable them to go out again and kill more Sandinistas, but that was a risk she had to take. One time, she thought she might have done just that. A bus she was riding was stopped by a group of seven or eight men carrying AK-47s. They told everybody to get off the bus and line up. Two or three of the passengers started to run away. The soldiers shot at them and hit one man in the ankle. She took off her headscarf and wrapped it around the man's leg to stop the bleeding. The soldiers were Sandinistas, and the wounded man was a Contra, and they were going to kill him. She said to the other passengers, We have to stop them. Let's lie on top of him and make a pile of bodies. The passengers looked at her as if she were crazy, and the Sandinistas started to drag the wounded man off behind some bushes. She followed them, yelling, Don't hurt him! I can see what you're doing! I'm a witness! Then one of the Sandinistas said, Okay, we'll give him to you. She dragged the man back onto the bus and brought him to a health center in Rio Blanco. Later, she found out that he was a robber. He recovered nicely and went back to robbing once his leg was healed. Did he kill people? She didn't know. Probably he did but she still felt she'd done the only thing she could have done. One afternoon, she was doing consultations in the clinic, and all the doors were open because it was so hot. She could see women and children outside in the corridor waiting to come in, and then, all of a sudden, everybody disappeared. She didn't know why until her next patient came in, and then she knew. He was a man with a terrible face. She had seen terrible faces like that on the men from the death squads in Guatemala. If you tortured and murdered, it did something to your face, she thought. The whole face looked hard and empty, as though it had been drained. She was told later that the man was the leader of a band of Contra who had done terrible things around Mulukuku, killing children, smashing a baby against a tree. He had come to the clinic because he had chronic pain in his head. A Sandinista bullet was lodged there. She told him she could give him something for pain, but he would have to see a neurologist in Madagalpa. She would make an appointment for him. He told her he could not go to Madagalpa, he would be killed. She told him she would take him there. After that, the man brought his wife to the clinic, and the wife brought her sisters and brothers, and all of their children. At last, the man brought his mother, and Dorothy knew they had won. Sometime later, the man heard of a group of Contras in the mountains who were planning to attack the clinic. The clinic got many death threats, because they were associated with the Sandinistas. <laughs> 
The man went to the group in the mountains and told them not to kill the clinic workers because they were taking care of Contra families. And the group did not come. For a while, the clinic itself was safe. But only the clinic. Sometime around 1995, when Dorothy was living by herself in the bamboo house on the edge of town, after a traumatic argument in which she threatened him with a knife, she and Charles had split up and he had gone back to Oregon, the cooperative heard that a group of Contras was going to come and kill them. There was a list of names, and Dorothy's was on it. The cooperative held a meeting to discuss what to do. Dorothy said that if a group of Contras with machine guns showed up at one of their doors, they weren't going to be able to fight back. Their only hope was to get the attackers to change their minds. So, instead of opposing them with violence, the cooperative members should offer them hospitality. The women decided that every night they would prepare some kind of food to offer the Contras should they reappear. Grethel said she would always have a plate of corn tamales ready. Dorothy said she didn't know how to make tamales, but she knew that Nicaraguans drank coffee day and night. So every evening before she went to bed, just before she let her fire burn out, she prepared a fresh pot. One night, the Contras came. They came to her house and called for her, Dona Dorotea, to open her door. There were two of them, each armed with a rifle. They accused her of carrying guns for Sandinistas in the mountains and said they were going to take her money. They figured that since she was a gringa, she must have some money. But when they ransacked her house, they found nothing. They were furious. Why didn't she have any money? She told them that there was a medical delegation in town, and she had given all her money to pay for transferring patients to the hospital. They kept poking her with their rifles, accusing her of running guns. She told them she was terrified of guns and never went near them. Then they told her they were going to rape her. She had known she might be killed, but she hadn't thought about rape. In the end, they did not rape her. They left. And then suddenly, as they were walking away, she remembered the coffee. She had been so frightened that she had forgotten all about it. She ran after them and called, Wait, I forgot something. Would you like a cup of coffee? The Contras told her they weren't going to drink her coffee. She would poison them. She assured them she would never poison them. She was a pacifist. She wasn't allowed to do that. They looked at her as if she were crazy and walked away. After that, she never spent another night in the bamboo house. She moved down into, ho into town where someone would hear her scream if something like that happened again. But the next bad thing that happened was so different that she was equally unprepared. In the 1996 elections, Arnaldo Aleman, head of the right-wing liberal alliance, known as El Gordo the Fat Man, defeated the Sandinistan president, Daniel Ortega. Aleman was convinced, she thought, that NGOs were allied with the Sandinistas and seemed to be trying to shut them down. In 2000, he accused Dorothy of treating leftist rebels and performing illegal abortions in order that she be deported. She went into hiding, staying in one friend's house after another, moving around in a car, wearing a scarf and dark glasses, feeling as if she were in a movie. The clinic closed down. She had been the only nurse. Human rights groups protested her persecution, and a group of U.S. congressmen sent a letter asking the government to change its mind. The case was written about so much in the press that Dorothy became famous throughout the country, referred to in the papers by her first name alone, Dorothea, as Daniel Ortega was always Daniel. After several months, a court suspended the deportation order, and she came out of hiding. She returned to Mulukuku and was received by happy crowds as 
in the words of a newspaper article about the event, a goddess, a martyr, a celestial messenger, a mother protector, a star, a sun that arrived to illuminate the lives of thousands. Six years later, Ortega, president again, presented her with the Order of Ruben Dario, the highest award given by the Nicaraguan government. At some point in her time at the clinic, she had realized that she no longer believed in God. It was too difficult, surrounded as she was by pain and war. On the other hand, by the time she stopped believing in God, she had started to believe in human beings. She had seen people do a lot of terrible things, but she had seen a lot of people doing heroic things as well. And in the 80s at least, she had seen what a revolution could be like. She had lived a long time before she saw people doing heroic things. By then, her expectations were so low, particularly of men, that it was not surprising that that brief surge of revolutionary fervor and public spiritedness in Nicaragua should appear to her almost like a miracle. She had always been a nurse, had always wanted to take care of people, but not until the middle of her life did she manage to claw her way out from her dreadful childhood and her dreadful marriage far enough to see that she could do more. It then seemed to her that it was not enough to be a nurse, doing worse that work that someone else would do if she didn't. She would change her life, and she would do work that needed to be done, but that other people wouldn't do, because it was too hard or too dangerous. She was raised Catholic in the ghetto in central LA. Her mother was Mexican, and they lived on the border of a Mexican neighborhood in what would later become known as Koreatown. But because her father was Filipino, as were all her mother's subsequent boyfriends, their family wasn't accepted there. Her mother was born in the States. Her father had owned a farm east of Los Angeles in Chino, but he lost it in the Depression. And soon after that, both he and his wife died. So, as a teenager, with three younger brothers to support, Dorothy's mother moved to the city to find work. She sold apples and newspapers on the street. And when she was 16 in 1930, she got pregnant and gave birth to Dorothy. Her mother was very pale, but Dorothy's father was dark and she came out dark like him. Her father was an immigrant from the southern part of the Philippines. She didn't know much about him. She knew that a lot of Filipinos had come over to California in the 20s to work in agriculture or build the railroads, so maybe he was one of them. He deserted her mother when Dorothy was an infant, and after that only reappeared from time to time. He was a violent man, and used to beat her mother. Her only clear memory of, memory of him was of the time he tried to kill them. She was about three years old, and they were driving somewhere in the hills above Hollywood. He was shouting, and her mother was crying, and he said he was going to drive them all off the cliff, and Dorothy, sitting in between her parents in the front seat, tried to pull the brake to stop the car. Later, she heard from someone she had grown up with that her father had been sentenced to life in prison and had been killed by another inmate in San Quentin. Her father kept moving in search of cheaper apartments and jobs. She worked in factories. She was too proud to clean houses. So Dorothy kept changing schools. At the end of grade school, she could barely read or write. Her mother had one boyfriend after another and the house was chaotic and violent. The boyfriends would hit her and beat her mother. She started running away when she was 10. Sometimes she would go to a relative's house. Sometimes she would sleep in an abandoned building 
one relative abused her sexually when she was a child. Dorothy was pretty sure he was also sleeping with her mother. A couple of times as a teenager, she attempted suicide. She skipped school a lot and went to the library or the museum. She was friends with a few Japanese kids until, when she was 11, white people ransacked their homes and imprisoned them in horse stalls at the Santa Anita racetrack and then in internment camps farther away. She knew she wanted to be a nurse. She knew she wanted to take care of people. And she knew that she couldn't be a nurse if she didn't graduate from high school. So she agreed to go with her stepfather to the Philippines to finish. He put her in a strict Dominican convent school, where she relieved her rage at the nuns by smoking in the bathroom, but she managed to graduate. She came to hate Catholicism. All she heard about when she was little was pain and sacrifice and the bleeding Jesus. Life was a veil of tears. It was always Good Friday for the Catholics she knew. When she entered an Episcopal church as a teenager, she saw an empty cross for the first time in her life. No bloody corpse nailed onto it, just an empty cross. She thought, of course, there had been a resurrection. The Episcopal church became her refuge. It felt safe and it gave a form to her anger. But then the Episcopal pastor seduced her when she was still in school, and the abuse continued for years. At the time, she didn't know it was abuse. She thought that she was being rescued, and this was the price. She moved away to live in Puerto Rico for three years, working as chief nurse in a hospital and directing a nursing school. She was working at the U.S. Army Hospital in Heidelberg when she met her first husband. Robert Cutler was a few years younger than she was. He was serving as an army doctor in Mannheim, but he had a bleeding ulcer, and so he ended up as her patient. He was a blue blood from New England. He grew up in Connecticut and played tennis and sailed at a summer home in Maine. His father was the head of a shipping company. She was dazzled, and she was as exotic to him as he was to her. They moved back to the States, married, settled in Chicago, and had a son, Christopher. Robert Cutler was a resident at the University Hospital, and Dorothy was director of medical nursing. They lived in Hyde Park. She wore peck and peck shirt waists and girdles and tried to be the perfect wife, but it didn't work. Robert Cutler started coming home only to eat, returning to his lab to work into the night. Finally, after 11 years together, they divorced. She pulled herself together and decided to change her life. She had realized long ago, when she was living in Puerto Rico, that it was only in Latino places that she really felt at home. She was done with middle-class life, she decided. Done with privilege done with being the exotic brown person among white people. She quit her job at the university hospital and went to work in the Mexican barrio as a nurse at the free clinic of a community center. Most of the people who showed up at the community center were Mexican immigrants working on the railroad. Some were Brown Berets, a militant Chicano group that came out of East LA. At first, she liked the Brown Berets and they liked her for improving the clinic but then they found out that she was still living in Hyde Park. Hyde Park was for white people, they said. Why didn't she live in the ghetto? She came from the ghetto, she told them, and she wasn't going back. The berets turned against her, and she was driven out. She thought, If I am not going to work in the barrio, I want to live someplace where Christopher can grow up canoeing and climbing mountains. She moved to Portland, Oregon and got a job as a nursing supervisor for the county health services. Then, one Sunday morning in 1978, she was in church when she suddenly heard, as if for the first time, that the colonel 
of Jesus' message was to resist violence and stand with the poor. She thought to herself in wonderment, it's so easy, so simple. To her, standing with the poor meant being one of them. She was no longer married to a doctor. She had left Chicago, but she still had a full-time job. She was earning $33,000 a year. She had a car, and she and Christopher had an eight-room house just for the two of them. Now she wanted to get rid of those things. Normally, if she made a decision, she acted on it immediately. But she didn't want to do that to Christopher. He had been raised as a doctor's son. She didn't want to drag him down into poverty with her. She decided that she would stay into the middle, in the middle class for a couple more years until Christopher went to college, and then she would get rid of everything. The resisting violence part, though, that she could act on now. She started to think about violence, and she decided that the most violent thing she could think of was a nuclear bomb. There weren't any nuclear bombs in Oregon, but there was a nuclear power plant. The Trojan plant in Prescott, 40 miles north of Portland on the Columbia River. Nuclear power plants and nuclear bombs were part of the same system, she thought. She joined the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a peace group that had been founded by Christians in Europe in 1914. It had supported conscientious objectors in the labor movement, freedom riders, and civil rights activists. It was against war, the death penalty, and nuclear power. It was exactly what she was looking for. The first time she got arrested, she spent four days in jail, locked in a cell with ten other women, all activists who'd been arrested with her. There were no beds, so they lay on the floor, and some of them were scared, but she wasn't scared. She was exhilarated. She said to the women, Do you know who is here in jail with us? Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day. It is a privilege to be in here, she told them. She felt that she was in a place that saints had passed through. She felt that she was home. Then, in the summer of 1980, she was involved in a break-in at the Trojan plant. She was too short to climb over the wall by herself, so a tall, skinny white man named Charles Gray lifted her up. It had been a long time since a man had touched her. Thus began the middle period of Dorothy's life, which she spent with a complicated man who was consumed by a strange moral hunger. He had started out doing normal things, like joining protests and giving sums of money away, but he craved more and more sacrifice and ended up nearly killing them both. A few years before he met Dorothy, he had committed himself to an extreme way of living that he believed justice required of him, whose radicalism was equaled only by its utter futility. He persuaded no one other than Dorothy to join him in it, and she had already decided to do something similar. And yet, over the years, many people read about his quixotic experiment and saw that they could change their lives more completely than they thought possible. Charles Gray was protesting at the Trojan plant because he was terrified of nuclear war. He had been terrified for years. So much so that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he had moved with his first wife and their young kids to New Zealand, which he had determined was highly unlikely to be attacked. At that time, he was a college professor, but after they got back to Oregon, he got involved with some politically radical Quakers and quit at academia to be an anti-nuclear and anti-poverty activist full-time. He had a flair for the work. 
He was always coming up with attention-grabbing ways of publicizing statistics and information, and soon became locally famous. He put together a roving anti-nuclear production, Dr. Atomic's world-famous medicine show and lending library, and he and some other people drove it all over Oregon by bicycle and VW bus. He had grown up poor, but his wife had inherited money, and now he and she have set about giving it away to political causes. They gave away half their capital and turned their house into a commune, but he wanted to do more. Giving away so much money? He had experienced a thrill of liberation, and he wanted to feel it again. He had always felt guilty about having the money in the first place, and now he saw how easy it was to slough off that guilt. He kept thinking about how it was wrong for them to have so much, when so many others had nothing. And after some time, he came up with the idea that he should live on his fair share of the world's wealth what he called the World's Equity Budget, or WEB. His first notion of this was simply to divide the world's total income by the number of people. But then he thought about future generations and decided that because the world population was growing, he would need to reduce his budget periodically to keep up. He ended up with a figure of about $1,200 a year. His wife refused to join him. She felt that giving away half her money was enough. She told him he had to choose between the world equity budget and her. Even though he still loved her, and they had been married for 30 years and had two children together, he chose the budget, and they got divorced. He gave away all his possessions except for a few clothes and household items. His friends thought it was strange and awful that he had given up his marriage in order to identify with a bunch of poor people he'd never even met. People thought he was acting pure and self-righteous and judging them for doing less so. They told him that what he was doing wasn't going to help any poor person. It had zero potential as a social movement. Nobody gave a damn. He was starving himself for no reason. What was needed was institutional change, not personal witness. But to him, those arguments just sounded like excuses for continuing to live like a rich person. He knew he wasn't starting a movement, though he did have a slogan for one, Get Poor Now, Avoid the Rush Later, and published a book-length manifesto toward a nonviolent economics. But he felt now that when he talked about equality and poverty, he was no longer just spouting phrases. He knew, of course, that choosing poverty was very different from having it thrust upon you, in that his education set him apart from most poor people, but at least now he no longer felt complicit in their misfortune. He felt, after years of guilt and conflict, at peace. At the end of 1980, Dorothy moved from Portland to Eugene. She had fallen in love with Charles Gray and taken on the whole package, world equity budget and all. He was funny and handsome and smart, and he was deeply committed to the same things she was committed to. It had taken him years of sorting out his financial affairs and psychological preparation before he was ready to change his life, but Dorothy dove in all at once. She had been waiting for this. She quit her job, sold her house, and gave everything else away keeping only two boxes of books and her bicycle. She didn't need money anymore. Christopher's father was now a professor at Stanford, and Stanford would pay for Christopher's college tuition. She realized, with a grateful sense of the immense privilege of her situation, that she was free. Dorothy loved living on the WEP. It was a challenge and an adventure. At that point, Charles was living on $62 a month, earning a tiny wage working as a carpenter. Dorothy worked part-time in a nursing home and threw herself into her activism. Charles taught her how to dumpster dive for food, and where the best dumpsters were, and she was an immediate convert. She never felt ashamed, as he had at first. She was astonished at the things you could find. There was a real bonanza once a year in the dumpsters outside the University of Oregon dormitories, 
when departing students would throw away all sorts of things, even furniture. She tried not to patronize the Safeway dumpsters, because she disapproved of Safeway. They sold products sprayed with insecticide, harvested by ill-treated workers. She was aware this was a ridiculous position, as if Safeway would care that she declined to sort through their garbage, but she stuck to it nonetheless. She realized that she could wear only one set of clothes at a time, and could be in only one room at a time, and could eat only so much food, and everything else was surplus. Most years they spent even less than they were entitled to. They knew that if one of them got really sick, either they would have to break the budget or they would do what the world's poor generally did in such situations die. But it didn't happen, so they didn't worry about it. Once, Charles ended up at a hospital and was classified as indigent, so he didn't have to pay. But in general, they tried to avoid welfare programs, even though they recognized that by using parks, libraries, roads, and city water, they were benefiting from America's wealth anyway. At one point early on, when they were living in one room together in a shared house, Charles told Dorothy he thought they should live on the street. They were using money to pay rent, that they could give away to people who needed it more. It had come to seem to him uncomfortably luxurious to live indoors. Dorothy told him she was not willing to live on the street. She didn't think it was pure, she didn't think anybody should live on the street. He was welcome to do it, but he would have to do it alone. The WEB was not, for her, about simplicity or purity. She aspired to neither. What about justice? She loved nice things, good food, good wine, and pretty clothes. She loved the security of money. She just didn't love them enough to feel right about contributing to an unjust world. She believed that God wanted her to stand with the poor. And that was what she was going to do. To do what she had to be poor herself. For Charles, the WEB was a moral absolute in itself that must not be violated. Going over the budget was a crisis for him. To her, the WEB was an idea, a guideline. And they, if they went over, well, that was life. I told Charles Gray, okay, I'm in love with you. I love the project. I'll join the World Equity Budget, but I must have my glass of wine before dinner and my coffee. I will not do without that. We used to fight. He was always adding up every penny. He kept a notebook. Once he told me I was 38 cents over budget. I said, would you repeat what you just said? And then I told him what he could do with his World Equity Budget. Charles needed to push himself to the limit of what he could do. There was no lightness in him. He felt that he was chosen, and his work was urgent. But she never felt that she or her life was particularly significant. She was just one small person among many others on the earth. He was a purist and a Puritan, she says. I don't know how I got involved with a Puritan. I'm Latina. I'm very loose. I don't know how I married him. It was an adventure. Plus, he was good in bed, because he'd had a lot of practice. People said that if there was a woman in Eugene who stood still for more than five minutes, he would seduce her. Charles's first wife had put up with his ideas about sexual liberty, but Jerk Dorothy was very churchy and very jealous. She had no interest in free love, and no doubts at all about whether screwing whomever you wanted might be an essential part of the liberation of humanity, or the path to a new world, or keeping in touch with your feelings, or anything like that. Charles didn't give up easily. He took her to a house in Eugene where eight or, men, eight or ten men and women lived together and kept a calendar to determine who would sleep together each night. They had to rotate regularly, or people might develop favorites. One man showed her around the house and explained their system. 
After listening to him patiently, she said to Charles, These people are nuts. If you want to be with me, you have to be monogamous. I'm too old and not athletic enough for experiments like that. They married in 1981 in a not-quite-legally-binding ceremony on the bank of the Willamette River. An Episcopal priest offered a mass and then performed the marriage ceremony from the Book of Common Prayer. Since they didn't believe in involving the state, they didn't get marriage certificates. She wore a long white muslin dress. He wore a white shirt and white pants. And they both wore lays that a friend had made for the occasion. Someone played the guitar, and everybody sang. All this time, Charles was still obsessed with the threat of nuclear war. He couldn't understand why it didn't terrify everyone. How could people just go about their lives as though everything was normal when the planet might be incinerated at any moment? It was crazy. The protests he had been involved in thus far, mostly climbing into nuclear plants, had clearly not had much impact. He had always been impressed by the effectiveness of Gandhi's fasts. Finally, in the late 1970s, he had decided that the situation was urgent enough that he had to oppose it with the strongest means available to him. An open-ended fast, possibly to the death. He had already started planning what he called the fast for life, in protest of the development of crews in Pershing missiles in Europe, when he met Dorothy and it was part of the package she signed on to. She agreed not only to accept it, but to join him. She felt strongly about the issue as well, but they felt strongly about it for different reasons. He was against nuclear bombs because he was worried about the world blowing up. She wasn't so anxious about the world ending. She was against bombs because they were expensive and siphoned away government money that could have been used to feed people. When she thought about nuclear weapons, she pictured children starving. They researched fasting and discovered that a long fast required training like anything else. You had to practice your body and prepare your body and mind. For three years they practiced. They did three-day fasts, week-long fasts, two-week fasts. For a year, they traveled all over the country and to Europe and Asia, recruiting fasters and spreading the word. Their flights were paid for by donors to the fasting organization, and they stayed in people's houses wherever they went. But this program was so completely out of tune with the WEB that it made them uncomfortable. During these preparations, in 1981, Bobby Sands, a young member of the Provisional Irish Republican Army died in prison while on hunger strike, and they saw that his death brought much sympathy and attention to his cause. They began the fast on Hiroshima Day, August 6, 1983. The Corps fasters set up headquarters in several cities. Four people in Paris, including Solange Fernet of the Green Party, two in Bonn, in Dorothy Charles, a Canadian, and a Japanese man in Oakland. In addition, thousands of other fasters fasted for less time, a day, three days, ten days. There was a communications officer, an office in Oakland, with ten volunteers to take calls and read letters and deal with the press. Willie Brandt met with the fasters in Bonn and vowed to oppose deployment of weapons in Germany. Two ministers from the Mitterrand government met with the fasters in Paris. After four days, Dorothy stopped feeling hungry. She just felt empty. She knew from her research that it took three weeks or so for the body to burn through the easily metabolized fat and start in on the muscle. Later on, she felt very, very tired. But at the same time, she felt a sense of spiritual well-being. A holy presence, as if God were with her. She came to feel that fasting was a kind of prayer. She was open to the idea of fasting to death, but there was Christopher to consider. She had vowed to him that she wasn't going to die. 
but in fact she was waiting to see what would happen. At some point after the fast began, Christopher read an interview or saw something on TV and realized that the fast was open-ended. He became very upset. The fact that his mother could consider doing that to him and that she had lied to him about it destroyed something in him. Even 30 years after the fast was over, he was still determined never to believe a promise or to make one himself. On September 1st, day 27 of the fast, Korean Airlines Flight 007, en route from New York to Seoul, was shot down by the Soviets over the Sea of Japan. Everyone on board, including a U.S. congressman, was killed. It was a terrible moment in the Cold War, and it soon became clear that if there was ever going to be a time when the United States might consider nuclear disarmament, this was not going to be it. Dorothy had lost 40 pounds and was beginning to go blind. On the 38th day, Daniel Berrigan, a well-known Catholic anti-nuclear activist whom Dorothy had great respect for, called her up and told her, It's enough. Stop. And she stopped. Two days later, on day 40, Charles stopped too. Some activists were angry. They said, he said he was going to fast to the death. He went back on his word. The fast doesn't count. Others were angry that they were fasting in the first place. They thought it was a violent thing to do. Dorothy and Charles felt that they had done what they could. After she and Charles recovered from the fast, Dorothy announced that it was her turn to set their agenda, and he agreed. The simple living thing and the fasting almost to death thing had been his ideas, and now she wanted to do something different. She told her fellow activists that she was moving to Nicaragua to be a nurse. They were shocked, and she was heavily criminalized, heavily criticized for leaving. Nobody could understand why she was doing it. Nobody said, what a great thing to do. I hope it goes well. She had been one of the elect, one of the few who understood how important the nuclear issue was and was willing to risk her life to confront it. And now she wanted to be a nurse? Anyone could be a nurse. How could she abandon the higher calling to peace? How could she be so selfish? One person said to her, if you're giving up the movement, Who's going to deal with racism? For years, she had been the brown person in the peace movement, helping the white people feel that they were working on race. She told him that racism was his problem, not hers. This was another thing that had always bothered her. It was a privilege to take days off to stage a protest, to get thrown in jail on purpose, a privilege to give up a middle-class salary and become poor. Most brown people didn't have that privilege. I remember talking to some black friends and they said, what are you doing with that white movement? Let them blow themselves up to hell with it. Who cares? She and Charles set off for Nicaragua. While stopping off in Mexico City, they received a message asking them to go immediately to Guatemala City. A friend of theirs, Elaine Richard, a French Franciscan worker priest whom they'd lived with in Oakland during the fast was alone and needed help. He was running a center that loaned meeting space to the Grupo de Apoya Mutuo, the GAM, a group consisting mostly of wives of women, wives of men who had been disappeared. Several of the wives were now also in danger and needed protection. Wives men who had been disappeared. They arrived on Tuesday of Holy Week, 1985. While they were on the bus from Mexico, a member of the GAM was kidnapped and then found dead, his tongue cut out. The day after they arrived, there was a meeting at the house. At this meeting was Rosario Godoy de Cuevas, 
a young woman married to a student leader at the university who had disappeared. She had a little boy, Augustine, who was about two years old. The evening after the meeting, Holy Thursday, Rosario and Augustine disappeared. The president of GAM, Nineth Garcia, called the center and said, Rosario is disappeared. We have to look for her. I will come for you. Nineth arrived in a taxi with four or five other women, all who were left of GAM's board of directors. Charles said he wasn't sure they should go because they didn't have any authorization. Dorothy said, if you don't want to do it, you stay here, but I'm going. It was already dark. First, they drove to the largest hospital to see if Rosario was in one of the morgues, but they couldn't find her. By this time, it was one in the morning. Nineth decided they should go to the DIT, the Departamento de Investigaciones Técnicas, the special police force under the control of the Ministry of the Interior, reputed to be staffed by members of the death squads. The DIT office they went to was a dirty room with not enough light. There was a small wooden bench in a waiting area and a counter with some men behind it. The men were terrifying. Dorothy leaned against a wall. Her knees were shaking so badly she thought she might fall down. Nineth pulled out a cigarette and asked her for a light. Right above them on the wall was a sign that said no fuma. Dorothy pointed to the sign, but Nina said, They're smoking. Ask them for a light. So Dorothy stumbled up to the desk and asked the men there if she could have a match. And Nineth lit her cigarette. Nineth amazed her. Something happened to people who had lost members of their families she saw. They were fearless. It wasn't that they didn't care about staying alive. They cared more about finding out what had happened. It became clear that the DIT men didn't know what had happened to Rosario, so they set off again. They decided to drive to Rabena Cemetery, to the oldest morgue in Guatemala City. By this time, it was three in the morning. It was now Good Friday, and the main streets of the city were blocked off to be transformed into a Via Dolorosa, covered with red flower petals. All night long, people had been strewing petals by lantern light to make the road of pain. They found their way through side streets and arrived at the morgue, and there was Rosario on a slab. Her younger brother and Augustine were there too, both dead. One side of Rosario's face was caved in in purple, and her hands were almost severed. They heard later that her brother and son had been tortured and murdered in front of her, and she had cut through her arms, which were tried up with wire, trying to stop it. After that night, Dorothy decided that Nineth as president of the GIM, was likely to be the next to go. So she, Dorothy, would protect her. She stuck to her 24 hours a day, everywhere she went. She hoped that since she was a U.S. citizen, registered with the embassy, the death squads might be reluctant to get involved in killing her. Elaine Richard had heard from a diplomat that everyone on the GAM board was on a list of people to be killed. She did this for three weeks. She was scared all the time. She knew that someone could dive out of a car at any moment and seize Nineth, and she felt it was her job to stop them. There was a white van with darkened windows that followed them around and parked outside Nineth's house. Dorothy didn't have a weapon, but she didn't want one. Carrying a gun scared her as much as the thought of being shot, and she knew that if the Death Squad men wanted to kill her, they'd do it, whether she had a gun or not. 
She figured if they tried to get Nineth, she would scream bloody murder, and maybe that would put them off. She didn't know what else to do. She was ready to die in Nineth's place. She thought Nineth's work was more important than her own, but she knew that wasn't likely to happen. More likely, she would just get hit on the head when the men came to take Nineth away. It, would draw, it drove Nineth crazy to have Dorothy next to her all the time, but Dorothy wouldn't let her alone for a moment. She considered it her job to keep Nineth alive. A few days after Rosario's death, the American State Department announced that the United States would be displeased if any more GAM members were killed. After three weeks, new people arrived to take her place. Peace Brigades International had decided to make accompaniment of five foreigners a regular part of its work, and she and Charles got on another bus and set out for Nicaragua. Dorothy worked in the clinic in Mulukuku for nearly 20 years. Near the end of that time, a free government clinic opened in the town, offering vaccines and curative care. Dorothy suggested that the co-op clinic reduce its services to those the government didn't offer. Pap smears, preventive medicine. She would train the government doctors to go out to the campo and do prenatal care in the settlements. The other women in the cooperative agreed, or she thought they did. But when she returned from a fundraising trip to the States, she discovered to her astonishment that the cooperative led by Grethel had decided to do something completely different, to turn the clinic into a private clinic that would charge fees for its services. Dorothy was appalled. After 20 years, after she had worked, all everything she had worked for had been rejected. She felt betrayed by the cooperative, but most of all, she felt betrayed by Grethel. They had been close friends for two decades, almost family. She had thought they shared the same politics, the same ideals, and they had been through so many difficult times together. Sometimes, trying to help people, they had upset others. One woman said she had asked them to help her put her daughters up for adoption, to protect her from her husband, who was in jail for allegedly raping her step his stepdaughter. But then the husband was released and accused the cooperative of arranging the adoption without his permission. Dorothy had thought that she would die in Rulukuku. Instead, she retreated to Managua and thought about what had happened. People had told her that U.S. donations were diminishing, so the clinic had no choice but to become more self-sufficient. Maybe that was true. She tried to remember that, even though it had gone against her and betrayed what she had thought was its purpose. She tried to remember the cooperative was still doing good things for Nicaraguan women. In Madagalpa, Dorothy worked from one day to the next. When she was working, she was happy. There was still a lot she could do for a lot of women who had almost nothing. Working was the only form of happiness she aspired to now. But it was happiness and it was enough. She didn't believe in an omnipotent God anymore. So instead, she hoped for decent governments. But her hopes, even for those, were much reduced. Nicaragua and the Sandinistas weren't what they had been. When the liberals came in, they had painted over the murals from the old days, and these weren't being replaced. When electricity finally came to Bulukuku in the late 90s, right away, every house, every poor house had a television. Houses where there wasn't enough food to eat 
And there was everyone watching telenovelas from Brazil and Mexico about the woes of rich people. Things were better than they had been, undoubtedly. People weren't starving, and there were government health clinics everywhere. But what was the point of the revolution if it was only going to produce another nation of consumers? Who cares if we have redistribution of wealth, if the poor become just as greedy as the rich, but on a smaller scale, she wonders. What's that got to do with being a human being? She was 84, but there was still much she wanted to do. She wanted to see places she had never been. She wanted to go to Peru and see Machu Picchu. Christopher had become a naturalist, working as a guide in the Amazon in Costa Rica, and every now and then she went on a trip with him she doesn't know how much time she has left. She survived so much malaria and mulukuku that she knows she is pretty tough. Her mother lived to 94, but she was demented when she died, and it was ugly. She doesn't want that. She has decided what she does want. When she is ready, when she can no longer take care of herself, she will stop eating and then stop taking liquids. One day, she will drink a last glass of wine. And then, a few days after that, she will die. She heard that Charles Gray died that way some years ago in Oregon, and that it was a good death. She has arranged everything with Christopher. He understands. 